Christ. Today I'm joined by Dr. Matthew Segal. Matt received his doctoral degree in 2016 in the Philosophy, Cosmology and Consciousness program from California Institute of Integral Studies, um, where he now teaches courses on German idealism and process philosophy for the program. He blogs regularly at foot, footnotes to plato.com and he vlogs also at footnotes to plato on YouTube. And um, then just to begin, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about your background and some of the key events in your life that have helped to form you and your love for God and what seems like a really keen desire to wrestle with life's more fundamental questions? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, um, I think philosophy started for me pretty early. Um, I usually uh, share this story that as a seven-year-old, I had this realization one day that my mother was going to die and it really um, turned my world upside down and, or you could say pulled the ground out from under my feet and threw me into this em emotional crisis, uh, this need for um, security because my mother was my sense of security. And when I realized that she was mortal, um, threw me into this crisis and it lasted probably a week. Uh, couldn't really stay in school for a whole day and, and would call her to come pick me up. And um, cause I was just worried she wouldn't be there when I got home. And then uh, by the end of this week, something shifted for me because I realized that I was going to die. And relating to my own death was um, not this source of insecurity and, and grief, but rather uh, deep mystery. And so, in other words, considering this um, event that we know we will each experience uh, death from my own sort of first person point of view opened into a mystery and it allowed me to reconsider what death meant for my mother. Um, it did not strike me as something that uh, was simply an end. And I don't know that <clears throat> I can say much with any, I know actually that I can't say much with any certainty about what happens after that threshold is crossed. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it is not what um, a secular materialist culture has or would lead us to believe. Um, and so that relationship to death, I think, um, you know, when I look back, really inaugurated my um, sense of um, a, li a philosophical life by which I would mean a, a life that's lived in relationship to wonder. Um, philosophy begins in wonder, uh, as Aristotle famously put it. And <clears throat> so, you know, from that point forward, I was just very interested in the big questions and in having conversations with people where um, exploration of matters of ultimate concern, as Paul Tillich might put it, mm -hmm. were were the topic uh, and small talk uh, gossip um, was never something that I had much patience for, you know, even from a young age. Um, and so sometimes I guess I could be a bit annoying. Um, I never wanted to come across as elitist, which is how some people can take the desire to always be doing philosophy. Mm -hmm. It can be intimidating, I think. Um, I, I certainly don't mean to ever come across that way. Uh, and I try to approach, um, you know, my my work as a philosopher because it is my profession, but it's also a way of life. Um, I try to approach it with humility um, in the face of of mystery. And so, um, you know, when I talk about my relationship to the divine, if I do talk about it, you know, I think I tend to be pretty cagey just because. Um, it's more about a relationship, which is a loving relationship, you know, as you framed it, uh, but it's a relationship to something that I find profoundly mysterious and don't claim to have um, the whole or only uh, version of the story that one might tell about this mystery, you know? So um, I'm always interested in having that conversation with people, but I don't go around, um, offering my perspectives unrequested, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, 
No, thanks very much, Matt. And thanks for answering my request. Yeah. So, <laughs> next, if I might ask you um, more specifically, then what drew you to process philosophy, to idealism, and some of those elements that have you've dedicated so much time to in your professional life as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my relationship to process philosophy, um, as well as idealism, and in particular German idealism, um, coming out of the work of Kant and moving through Fichte, uh, Schelling and Hegel and, and Goethe is in the mix there too. So that specific form of idealism is where I really orient myself, idealism. I mean, Platonism too, obviously. Um, but uh, I came to these really only in graduate school. Um, and so my earlier education, I think what primed me to be receptive to both thinkers, thinkers like Whitehead and, and the idealists was my study of Carl Jung um, and his, his depth psychological point of view, as well as his psychology of religion, um, his understanding of the evolution of consciousness, which is also the evolution of the God image in human history. Um, this is really what um, primed me to be interested in, uh, you know, a conception of the universe like Whitehead's, um, where rather than imagining um, the cosmos to be a collection of, of particles uh, falling in the void or just matter in motion, you know, he invites us to understand the cosmos as a creative process that is um, you know, imbued with divine intention, let's say, and that um, the evolution of the universe and the, um, the unfolding of divine consciousness, you might say, are, you know, two sides of the same coin, as it were. And so, you know, Whitehead's philosophy is attractive to me because it allows us to bring science and religion, which in our day and age are typically um, pitted against one another uh, in the culture wars. Um, Whitehead allows us to see that these two um, uh, modes of knowing and, and ways of being also uh, are, they, they require one another in order to be healthy, uh, you know, as yes, independent ways of knowing, but also interdependent in the sense that um, you need you need a good religious foundation for your science and um, you need also for your religion to be scientifically um, valid mm -hmm. <laughs> and supported. Um, and, and with the German idealists, you know, similarly, um, particularly uh, Friedrich Schelling, um, who a lot of my research draws upon uh, trying to integrate his philosophy of nature with Whitehead's um, they similarly allow us to understand, uh, and Schelling in particular, to understand the relationship between mind and nature uh, in a way that is <clears throat> integrative uh, rather than reductionistic, right? And so rather than saying that mind just comes out of nature as a kind of accident, uh, historical accident, and that it wasn't in some ways prefigured from the beginning, um, you know, Schelling allows us, as I was describing Whitehead's view, that Schelling allows us to see how um, mind has been implicit in nature from the beginning, where you could say spirit has been enfolded within nature, within the physical from the very beginning. And what evolution is, is the gradual revelation of or unfolding of spirit out of matter. And so, you know, I find these views very compelling. Um, and continue to try to think with them and apply them to contemporary issues in culture and science and, and religion. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that, Matt. And um, next, I want to ask you, so you, you hit up the one stereotype there, which is this kind of myth of science versus religion, or uh, um, nature versus mind. There seems to be another one where people perceive, uh, if you ask the big questions, that your head's in the clouds. And um, I want to ask you, in line with that, actually, you talked about being there. How has have um, your studies helped you to live a better life then? Hmm. 
Well, I mean, the struggle to live a better life is uh, lifelong, you know, and so I think um, I wouldn't claim to have arrived uh, at, you know, the, the right mode of being. Um, it is a striving, it is a, um, you know, a continual approach to uh, what would be the, the good life. Um, and I have a lot to learn in, in that domain, but you know, I think we're in a, a cultural moment right now when there are so many distractions uh, from what I would consider to be the matters of ultimate concern. Um, we are under constant temptation uh, to um, give our lives over and our attention uh, over to um, to things that are uh, not really of value to ourselves or others, but that um, limit us, uh, limit us to the fleeting pleasures of the senses, limit us to um, forms of, um, of, of, of pleasure that um, will not uh, really stay with us if, if we look at the long trajectory of our existence, um, I really do fear for uh, the direction that our culture is headed because it has totally lost any anchoring in, um, it, it wouldn't even need to be religious uh, grounding, but anchoring even in um, humanistic values. I mean, everything has just become so short-sighted and obsessed with, with greed and immediate gratification. Uh, and so to my mind, the, the, the first thing to consider when trying to orient oneself toward the good is, um, is to notice the difference between what are the, as Plato would say, the shadows projected on the cave wall mm -hmm. uh, and turn around as it were, or experience this metanoia to recognize what's the source of the light don't be obsessed with the shadows on the cave wall, but consider the source of the light, which is required for there to even be shadows. And, you know, by turning our attention to these deeper um, matters, uh, I think we inevitably become better, <laughs> better people. Um, you know, so I think that's my, my general orientation towards a question like that. And, um, I don't know if you were looking for like specific practices, uh, but it's more of a general attitude toward all, uh, all of the aspects of our, of our life from, you know, diet to diet and exercise and like the sort of aesthetic, uh, ascetic, I should say, components of, of a spiritual life to maintain our organism in a way that allows it to function clearly in its intellectual and, and spiritual and contemplative activities um and you know our ethics how we relate to other human beings um if we think of other human beings just as potential sources for our own pleasure rather than as ends in themselves um you know that's to stray down a path that leads i think ultimately to uh the degradation of one's own soul not to mention the souls of others you know so treating others badly is also to treat oneself as less than human mm -hmm. um so no thanks very much for that matt um it's most important and then um we mentioned a few names there we mentioned whitehead and a few others are there any other persons who've been especially inspirational or influential for you that you'd like to tell us about oh sure um I mentioned Carl Jung. I, I should also mention um, William James, uh, who's an American psychologist and philosopher. Uh, he wrote a book called The Varieties of Religious Experience, uh, which is an important source of orientation for me in the study of um, human spiritual and religious expression. Um, because in my own life and development um it's certain experiences that have been transformative to me and so james in foregrounding religious experience rather than say religious doctrine uh or um 
you know, the more um, written codified forms uh, of religious life, which may be important too, but James really wants to know how individuals have experienced God. And um, so his work has been really important to me. Um, Rudolf Steiner would be another name I should, I should mention. He's sort of a um, esoteric uh, Christian philosopher. Um, I think I can call him an esoteric Christian, even though he really sees all the world's religions as and 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 spiritual figures from w- whether it's Buddha or Krishna or Zarathustra, you know, these other founders of religions in the human in, in the human past are all part of his pantheon, as it were, mm-hmm. even though um the Christ being has a unique role to play in Steiner's view. Um but his philosophy and, and many of the practical initiatives that he started are um, of, of deep and abiding interest to me. Um, and uh, I continue to draw inspiration from his work, which is huge. You know, the collected works of yeah. just lecture transcripts and the books that he published. Um, one could spend a life and never get to all of it. So, um, and Sri Aurobindo, you, you, you mentioned him in, in our, uh, emails uh, before this interview. Um, he's this evolutionary spiritual philosopher who I think I could describe his philosophy in, in a way similar to Whitehead and Schelling, um, really bringing our understanding of spirit and matter and God and the world into uh, harmony with each other, right? So these aren't opposed, God's not opposed to the world. God needs the world, the world needs God. Spirit needs matter, matter needs spirit. Um, Aurobindo has this beautiful, poetic, uh, and inspired way of um, writing about these mysteries. And so he's been an influence uh, as well. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Matt. And um, next, if we might, I'd love to look at your book, Physics of the World Soul, Alfred North Whitehead's Adventure in Cosmology. So um, just first, can you give us a brief overview of that book and what you hope that readers will take away from it? Yeah, so um, it's basically an attempt to show how Whitehead's philosophy is relevant to some of the key questions in contemporary uh, science, or natural science. Um, and so I try to introduce Whitehead's um, philosophy in a way that uh, would be digestible to um, you know your your average college graduate, I hope, and. Um, I try not to presuppose uh, a deep study of, of Whitehead. Um, and then I try to uh, engage with four different, uh, let's call them theoretical paradigms in contemporary natural science, um, evolutionary theory, uh, complexity theory, quantum theory, and uh, relativity theory. Okay, so the quantum and relativity theories in physics and evolutionary theory in biology and complexity theory is kind of um, very interdisciplinary. It, it, complexity science is looking for those patterns that um, apply at all scales in nature, whether you're talking about the physical, the biological, or the psychological and social. Complexity theorists are looking for um, rules uh, that account for forms of organization at all of these different scales. And in many ways, you know, Whitehead's philosophy prefigures what we now call complex systems theory. Um, many of the founders of complexity theory were influenced by Whitehead and so on. <clears throat> and so I go through these different theoretical paradigms and show how Whitehead's metaphysics helps us solve some of the, um, the problems that have come up uh, within these paradigms. And, um, you know, in the process, I introduce Whitehead's theology, his process theology, which um, typically, you know, most physicists, uh, although there are some notable exceptions, but most physicists and biologists are not going to want to bring God into a conversation um, about science. Mm -hmm. But I think Whitehead does so in a way that is unique. um, And in other words, it differs from how, say, intelligent design theorists um, or creationists might want to talk about the God hypothesis. 
um, Whitehead's not offering God as a scientific hypothesis, but rather as a, a metaphysical premise. Um, rather than leaning on God to explain something like the origin of life or whatever, Whitehead is, is rather uh, understanding the divine as um, what's required for explanation as such to be possible, right? So this is a metaphysical issue. It's not a scientific hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we can go more into the ins and outs of that distinction, but it's what makes Whitehead um, and other thinkers like, like Terra de Chardin as well, um, who, who were grappling with this division between religion and science, what makes them different from um, intelligent design theorists is uh, seeing God as um, a metaphysical uh, question rather than something that should be used to, as it were, like intervene in the natural course of events so as to explain some natural phenomenon. Like mm -hmm. that's the domain of science. Uh, religion, I think, is at a different layer uh, of, of our, you know, understanding of reality. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I situate the book and what it's trying to do. Great, thank you, Matt. And um, mm -hmm. is there anything within the book that you think is important to market as different from other books looking at Whitehead today or in the past? I mean, um... There are a lot of great books on Whitehead. Um, I think what makes mine different is I'm really trying to step into um, a conversation with some contemporary debates uh, and theorists, scientists, um, you know, engaging with the work of um, Terence Deacon and um, also um, philosophers of biology like um, uh, Evan Thompson and, um, and others just trying to make Whitehead's um, ideas as relevant as possible to what conversations are happening now um, among scientists and, and philosophers. <clears throat> and so, you know, it's not just a book trying to explain Whitehead. It's also uh, trying to intervene in, in these debates uh, directly. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. And um, what is it then that's central to Whitehead's cosmology, building upon what you said before? And how did it grow from physics to philosophy, as you describe it in the book? Hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, Whitehead's a mathematician, first and foremost, and was very interested um, in his early career in um, unifying all the different branches of mathematics and developing what he called a universal algebra, um, which would be this basically a symbolic language that can um, connect all of these various uh, sub-disciplines of, of mathematics and also um, help us understand the structure of the physical world. Um, and so, you know, in, in the early 1900s, the first decade of the 20th century, um, Whitehead began working with uh, Bertrand Russell to develop a, uh, the, a math, uh, rather a logical foundation for mathematics. And uh, they didn't end up really succeeding in this project, but they raised all sorts of interesting problems that um, continue to be debated uh, among analytic philosophers and mathematicians and log logicians. But right around this time, um, Albert Einstein came onto the scene and uh, introduced his special and then general theory of relativity. And um, this was uh, really earth break, earth shattering uh, for, uh, for Whitehead in the sense that um, he, had, he had thought that, um, and everyone else had thought that Newtonian physics was basically almost finished. And we almost, in terms of matter in motion, uh, mechanically obeying mechanical laws um, that the whole of nature could be explained. And then comes along comes Einstein. Um, and, you know, just prior to Einstein, some discoveries about the nature of uh, radiation, black body radiation, and the beginnings of quantum theory were also signs that the old mechanistic paradigm was breaking down. Um, and so in an attempt to understand the 
revolution in physics that Einstein uh, introduced, Whitehead was sort of dragged out of mathematics and into metaphysics because he realized that this, what Einstein was saying about the nature of space and time and what the quantum physicists were saying about the nature of matter and energy uh, required that we think in new categories that were not just the, um, the categories that Newton and Descartes and Galileo were working with because it turns out that um, the universe is not just a collection of parts. Uh, it is that we observe as if from the outside. Um, science had to be reimagined in light of the discoveries of like the most reductionistic uh, physics. Mm -hmm. Science had to be reimagined uh, such that the observer was part of the system. I have this fly who's really bugging me right now. <laughs> Um, such that the observer was part of the system it was trying to understand, right? Relativity and quantum theories both raise this issue in their own ways. And so how do you, in other words, put mind back into nature? Because it turns out that nature, when you try to understand it without mind, leads to all of these strange paradoxes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a hundred years later, after Whitehead offered his new philosophy, he called it the philosophy of organism or process philosophy, um, there still is not a consensus among physicists about how to um, bring relativity and quantum theory together, um, nor about, there's no consensus about how um, the consciousness of the observer is, is related to the collapse of the wave function, say, in quantum theory, um, or how our experience of the flow of time is related to the things that Einstein says about uh, the space-time continuum. Um, so I think Whitehead is in many ways still ahead of us. And so what I'm really trying to do is point people to his work in the hopes that it helps resolve these, these issues that we continue to be confused by. Mm, fantastic, thank you, Matt. And um, are there any other elements of how his um, philosophy of organism transcends our current very often crude physical physicalist conception that you'd like to um offer us just to, for those who maybe aren't familiar with the underlying presuppositions of something like philosophical naturalism or... mm -hmm. yeah so typically naturalism uh as a as a metaphysical um position would say that uh nature is um, a set of, uh, nature is, a, there's a set of laws that's determining the behavior of um, some sort of things. And uh, a naturalist will wanna say that there's causal closure in the sense that there's nothing outside of these laws, which we know mathematically. Um, and the, uh, the way that those laws determine the behavior of these entities, which the entities are considered to be particles or they could be fields. The entities could be really anything. Um, so long as they don't have aim or purpose or feeling or mind or the capacity to make decisions. Um, so typically naturalism rejects teleology, which is purpose, right? Uh, and it's rejecting that there is any sense to be made of, um, you know, what Teilhard de Chardin called the within of things, what Whitehead would, would just refer to as experience. Um, and so if, if that's what we mean by naturalism, right, uh, that the universe is a collection of objects obeying fixed laws, then Whitehead's not a naturalist. But he's also not one who found it necessary to make reference to something supernatural, which, you know, if he's talking about God, people might wonder how I could possibly say that Whitehead wasn't talking about anything supernatural, but um, Whitehead's God is not to be imagined as something set apart from nature. Uh, however, Whitehead's conception of nature is quite different from most naturalists. Uh, for Whitehead, um, nature, as it, as it reveals itself to us perceptually, um, is not just uh, 
particles in motion, quite obviously, it is just as much um, about colors and scents uh, and sounds and rhythms and um, all of these qualitative dimensions that the, let's say, the materialistic naturalist wanted to say were not part of nature, but part of our mind that we project color. You know, the beauty of a, of a sunset is a projection of the human, according to a materialist, which raises the question of why in a materialist universe there should be any conscious experience at all. Um, but for Whitehead, all of these qualities are not just conjured up in this mind uh, that belongs solely to human beings. Rather, these qualities are in nature uh, and that nature is itself the realization of purposes, of aims. And so Whitehead is um, going back to Galileo, really, who was one of the earliest uh, figures, one of the founders of modern science, right, to separate out the qualitative and quantitative aspects of nature and say that the quantitative stuff is primary and physical and the qualitative stuff is a secondary mental projection. And Galileo said, science is the study of the quantities. Um, Whitehead is saying, no, science is just the study of what we are aware of in perception, right? And what we are aware of, aware of in perception is not just the stuff that science measures, that's there too, but also all the stuff that the nature poets are, um, you know, writing their poetry about all the beauty, the value, uh, the wholeness and the, the, the encompassing um, wholeness of nature is something that also needs to figure in our scientific explanations. <clears throat> so Whiteheadian naturalism is more of a romantic naturalism, I would say. Uh, it's not a reductionistic naturalism. And the role of God in nature for Whitehead is not as a coercive external power that can reach in and tinker with what's happening. Uh, rather, God has been part of the universe in its evolution from the beginning as a allure toward more beautiful experience. And so God acts um, as a... Uh, as a sort of whisper that every creature hears that is suggestive of um, modes of expression that would contribute to the greater harmony of things. That whisper can't force a creature to do anything, but it can uh, inspire the creature to uh, have to tend towards that beauty. Right. But creatures are in Whitehead's view, you know, each of us is free and we don't have to listen to this whisper. Um, you know, creatures are, uh, they exist for their own sake in the sense that they, you know, Whitehead wouldn't want to say that um, all creatures exist only for the joy of God or the glory of God. Whitehead would say that, no, the, actually the glory of God is to exist in all these many individual forms. And so each creature has its own dignity, right? That yes, is an expression of the divine, but uh, Whitehead is, is in a way trying to reverse the traditional sense of the preeminence of God over and against the world and say that no, the, the true glory of God is in having created the world as a, uh, a self-existing and in, in many ways self-creating community uh, of creatures. And so like, and, and, you know, I'll hold off, we can go more into this later, but I, I um, you know, I see Whitehead's view of the divine as deeply incarnational, uh, you know, in the sense that an incarnation has occurred, which makes God um, in some ways dependent on the world. Whereas traditionally we wanna say, uh, traditional theologians, from various religious traditions would want to say that, no, no, the world is dependent on God. Um, Whitehead's worldly divinity, as I describe it in the book, is, is trying to balance that traditional perspective out. Fantastic, thank you, Matt. And uh, that fits nicely, actually, with a couple of my forthcoming guests for my, my channel, too. Um, Rabbi Shai Held has looked at 
the work of Abraham Joshua Heschel and um, found something very similar in Heschel's work. And mm -hmm. then um, Dr. Michael Martin, who I'll be speaking with, he has spoken about Sophia uh, from mm -hmm. the Russian sociologists and goes through a sociology and is very much in line with what you're saying about Whitehead. So mm -hmm. thank God there seems to be a lot of exciting pro progressions in this area. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad to be a part of it with yourself in those guys. So I appreciate that. And um, I want to ask you next, if I may then, Matt, about how we might come to view space-time then in this um, process relational ontology and how should that help us to flourish in our embodied existence in a more incarnate sense, as you sort of hint hinted at there? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, Whitehead definitely wants to follow Einstein into a more relativistic conception of space and time. And in Einstein, you get a dynamic view of space time, not as a container, uh, as Newton had it, um, that we exist inside of. And in a way, the Newtonian understanding of space and time to me feels more, um, more isolated. It's, it's more like a kind of crucifixion in the sense that you are uh, in this, in, in Newtonian space and time, absolute space and time, um, I feel more like you're stuck in this um, deterministic machine. Uh, and even though there's this esoteric side of Newton, where of course he says that space is the sensorium of God. Uh, so there's something more to you know, Newton's universe isn't quite as mechanistic as he's, as it's often implied. Um, but still in an absolute space and time um, container, uh, I feel like the creatures in that situation um, are, they're separated absolutely from the divine uh, in the sense that they're, they're limited and they're, they're, they're simply located and kind of trapped or crucified in this um, absolute space and time. And I think, so there are other theological possibilities that emerge when we consider an Einsteinian space-time uh, continuum. And Whitehead helps us, uh, I think, surface those theological implications uh, because for Whitehead, um, in a way, he's, he's trying to unpack what Newton might've meant by saying, space is the sensorium of God. Um, for Whitehead, space-time is, 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 we have to not think of it as something already actualized that's out there that we're moving through, right? Um, sometimes even Einstein's theory is sort of depicted in this way, but uh, Whitehead helps us see that um, space-time is a field of potentiality it's not an already actualized um, place that we, or, or uh, field that we move through. It's a field brought forth by um, our own interaction with each other. And here each other is not just other human beings. It's all of the creatures that make up um, the cosmos from photons on up. Uh, and so in other words, um, space time, rather than being a pre-existing container for all of our activity, space-time is this field of potentiality implied by all of our activity. And in each moment, it's being, um, it's being reorganized. Uh, now there's a lot of um, inherited uh, patterns and, and a sort of habitual um, uh, form or a habitual shape that this space-time field takes because we all have a shared history. Uh, and so we're all evolving together in this, um, this field of potentiality. And each of our decisions is contributing to its further uh, manifestation, right? And so God's role in this is um, kind of to provide uh, the, the cosmic genetic code, if you will, uh, that sets the, the potential relations that um, we can all enter into in space and time. And so Whitehead thinks that there are certain, and he tries to, to define these geometrically, um, certain types of mathematical relationships uh, that determine how wholes and parts relate and overlap one another. 
uh, that he sees as um, sort of written into the very structure of potential that shapes uh, what we call space-time. And I guess you could say that this is where Whitehead's theology uh, becomes important. Um, why does space-time have a structure that we can understand mathematically? Um, Whitehead finds it hard to explain this bizarre fact without making reference to some divine agency. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but again, I would say that this is not a scientific hypothesis. It's rather a metaphysical postulate that allows us, uh, that, that makes science possible in the first place, mm -hmm. right? So God for Whitehead is, he admits it's, it's totally irrational, but it provides the ground for what we call rationality. Um, and so he would want scientists to do their work without making reference to the agency of God. But in order to do that work, they have to use, um, they already have this underlying faith that mathematics can reveal uh, the structure of space-time to them, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then from that basic postulate, then they can use mathematics to make sense of nature without having to say, oh, at this particular moment, God reached in and did this. Um, so it, nature has its integrity, uh, but you know the metaphysical basis for that kind of investigation uh, is theological in some way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Matt. And um, taking us on to a modern thinker now, I want to ask you next, if I may, about um, transhumanist Nick Bostrom and how does Whitehead then contrast in his understanding of the incompleteness of nature, say, with someone like Bostrom or the modern transhumanists? Yeah, so I don't know Bostrom's work well enough to comment um, in too much depth, but I know he considers things like the simulation um, hypothesis. And um, I think there's a lot of hype around uh, computation and computational metaphors. And um, to me, this is an example of um, model centrism in science. Uh, Whitehead would call it um, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, where we mistake a model that's very useful for different applications um, for the reality. And the idea, the transhumanist idea, uh, you know, that consciousness is the sort of thing that might be um, downloaded onto the internet or, uh, or that uh, in some way a computer could simulate something identical to consciousness. Um, I think this is just full of category errors and misunderstandings. Um, you know, I don't think that consciousness is um, substrate neutral would be the technical term. I think that there is something innately biological about it. And, you know, which is not to say that um, some future technology that incorporates uh, organic, uh, that it incorporates digital technologies into an organic substrate of some kind might not produce a consciousness, you know, probably could. Um, so I'm not denying the technological uh, potentials here, but I am questioning, uh, I would question the ethics of the, those sorts of endeavors because we're basically, um, playing the role of Dr. Frankenstein and uh, it's, it doesn't necessarily, it, it's <laughs> the ethical uh, quandaries are just um, multiply infinitely as soon as you start to inquire into that sort of a thing. But unfortunately we live in a world where if science can do it, it will. Uh, and um, so, you know, these are important areas to for philosophers and theologians and others to inquire into. And I worry about the transhumanist project because to me, it's it feels like a surrogate religion that doesn't always recognize itself as such. Mm -hmm. And, you know, imagines that um, 
you know, a lot of transhumanists might, might say that, yeah, we should bring God back into the conversation, but uh, it's the sort of God that we will be creating soon as, as the AI boots up. Um, and I think this is, is sort of um, very, it's a very, I mean, the myths that come to mind for me are like Icarus or uh, Prometheus, or um, it just feels like there's a tragic ending to this endeavor. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I started earlier uh, talking about my relationship to death as a seven-year-old and um, transhumanists also uh, have something to say about this, uh, this issue, which is that death is a disease and um, <clears throat> something that we can, with science and, and technology overcome, we can cure death. Uh, and, you know, I've gotten into some arguments with transhumanists who hold this position and they will refer to me as a deathist uh, because I find meaning in this um, inevitability of human life. Uh, in some ways, death, I think, is the source of the purpose of an individual human life. It's a reminder of what our real purpose here is, right, which is not to just accumulate stuff and status for this particular body because this body is going to die and decay and uh so life's pur purpose must i think if we're going to find purpose in life in some way transcend the death and decay of this body and the transhumanists seem to be wanting to preserve their um skin encapsulated egos basically indefinitely and to me that short circuits the whole purpose of creation <laughs> Um, and so it's an important cultural argument, uh, or cultural debate, I should say, to be involved in because it's shaping the future course of human evolution. Um, and I think, uh, not in the right direction. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that, Matt. I concur. <laughs> and, um, on the other side, then if we might look at antinatalism, then I want to ask you a little bit about um, what Marx Whitehead's work and indeed yours um, from these quite popular, again, often physicalist antinatalist philosophies. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, uh, I have a long history on, on YouTube and I have had some arguments over the years with antinatalists and I think their view of nature, the form of naturalism that they hold to, I think I would contest and offer a white headian alternative to it. But putting that issue to the side, um, I do actually accept, um, or at least I take, I take to heart, uh, because I've had some heart to hearts with antinatalists and their, their real reasons kind of on a personal and emotional and, and psychological level for coming to a view of the world like that. And I, I have a lot of compassion for them because if you consider human history and go back in time billions of years and consider how much suffering has been involved in the evolutionary process and how many individuals have, have um, been sacrificed for the sake of this collective endeavor. Um, sacrifice is a huge part of um, the, the evolutionary process. And which is, it's, this is one of the areas where I think there's, there's hope for convergence between science and religion because sacrifice is also a huge part of religious uh, existence and understanding. And so, you know, I, I guess what I want to say is I, I have sympathy for the, um, the sense of, of tragedy that antinatalists, uh, you know, experience uh, and, and feel when they look at our state and, and our history. And so, you know, the question for me is not whether or not... Uh, there is suffering, of course there is. It's, is it justified? Is it uh, in some way conducive to the glory, the glorification of God? <laughs> and I think what Whitehead's view allows us to see is that God suffers with the world. 
Whitehead says God is a fellow sufferer, right? And so God is not um, outside the world like some sort of executioner or torturer and we're in the torture chamber and, you know, God's doing these experiments on us. You no, know, God is experiencing it with us, right? And so I think actually there's a hidden theology in the um, atheism of antinatalists, which is there's a, a sense of hatred for God. Like, why did you do this to me? And it might not be explicit. It's usually not explicit. It might not be recognized um, by the antinatalists themselves, but I really feel this there's a hidden theology here, which is this, you know, unwillingness to forgive God, a particular image of God uh, for their existence and for the suffering that they've experienced. And so it's an image of God as, you know, external to the world. Uh, and I think what Whitehead sort of, Whitehead allows us to to diffuse this whole framework and instead recognize that um, God is not responsible for the state of the world. It, it takes the power away from God and in a way radically distributes that power among the creatures of the world who uh, are participating with God in, in that world's creation. And when you, when you feel that God is suffering with the world, God becomes a companion and a source of solace in, you know, the, the suffering. And so, of course, there is joy and there is love and there is cause for celebration. And I, I think, um, you know, I'd love to, in whatever small ways I can contribute to making a world where we can experience and more people can experience joy and love and celebration. Uh, and that's, that's an ongoing project. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, the point is not to just be happy all the time. Um, happiness is fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not the purpose of our existence. Uh, and, you know, from Whitehead's point of view, the purpose of existence is beauty and the highest form of beauty is tragic beauty. And so, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien um, in his uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy articulates what he calls a you catastrophe. And he's, he understood the Bible as well as a kind of you catastrophe. Um, and you catastrophe is just that it's a, it's a, um, form of tragic beauty. And so, you know, in Whitehead's view, God saves the world by making it beautiful, not by undoing all the bad things that happen, mm -hmm. uh, but by putting them into a larger context, um, allowing, raising us to a perspective and to a consciousness that uh, in some way atones for all the bad things. Um, so, yeah, I guess I, I, I can feel a lot of compassion for the antinatalists and I think they need to do some theological uh, reconsideration, recognize this theological structure of their worldview uh, and see that there's, that that's, they're imagining the same kind of God that they think is silly uh, and, and accused theists of believing in um, that same type of God, I think is still functioning in their own worldview. Mm. And thank you, Matt. And um, <clears throat> I think you see this even in the arts in um, Dostoevsky and um, Terence Malick's beautiful movies that wrestle with those serious issues. And I appreciate that there. Mm -hmm. and, um, next, I think relevant to that in helping us to frame our modern, um, well, is separate from our modern notion of politics is cut off from these other ultimate concerns um, I want to ask you about how insights drawn from people like Whitehead and more integral notions then trickle down into how we organize ourselves politically 
And um, why would this be helpful, especially at a very partisan time across the English speaking world, at least, and I'm sure elsewhere too. I don't know, even my um, wife, she's Zimbabwean, and she'll tell you too that it's not unique to the West by any means. And um, nowadays, when one's identity in maybe an egocentric way is heavily vested in, say, political parties or ideologies, more than some of these more traditional and universal senses that you're hinting at there. Would you like to speak to that point there, Matt? Yeah, it's a really important question right now. <laughs> and um, I think it's obvious that in our um, sort of hyper secular world uh, where the highest values uh, emanate from the capitalist uh, marketplace um, that people turn to politics for some source of um, orientation and some sense of being uh, uh, some sense of being on the right side of history um, and politics is being asked to do and political identity uh, a lot of work now that um, used to be done by by religion, uh, and so I mean a lot of progressive politics, in particular, I think is it verges on utopianism uh, because it's conflating religious ideals with um, political programs, uh, and on on the right, you know, among conservatives, I think. Um, in, you know, I know the American situation best. I think it's uh, unique in some ways and maybe not in others, but, you know, typically evangelical and fundamentalist forms of Christianity in, in America uh, are, have aligned themselves with the interests of the capitalist market and big corporations and um, somehow think that, uh, you know, wealth and uh, uh, corporate profits uh, as the be all and end all are compatible with um, the teachings of Jesus. Um, you know, it's not that we need to shun money uh, or that money is inherently impure. It's just, I think it's, it's a, there's a strange, um, a strange wedding has occurred between American, much American Christianity and, and capitalism um, among conservatives that I think, uh, it distorts both Christianity and the potential of markets. Um, and so, you know, one way of, of clarifying the social situation um, for human beings right now actually comes out of Rudolf Steiner's work. Um, he, Steiner articulated what he called um, the threefold social organism. Uh, and he developed this in Germany after World War I, when there was this very revolutionary moment and, um, you know, communism was rising in, uh, in Russia, what became the Soviet Union and, um, you know, the Communist Party and the Democratic Socialist Party in Germany was really on the rise. Workers were demanding rights, um, going on strike and, and sort of, uh, throwing around their political weight in, in a way that challenged the established order in Europe and, um, <clears throat> and around the world. And so Steiner tried to intervene in this to both uh, encourage a kind of workers revolt uh, against the owners, the capitalist class, but also uh, to check the um, totalizing tendencies of the communist uh, Marxist point, point of view or political program. You know, and so what Steiner suggested was, you know, he would say to the workers, like, yes, um, we need a cooperative economy where there is no um, class division between workers and owners. Workers should own uh, their own labor. They should own the means of production, but we need to maintain markets. Uh, in other words, we don't want to squash the entrepreneurial spirit. And so we have uh, worker-owned firms competing with one another in a free market. Steiner also didn't want the workers to imagine that um, a dictatorship of the proletariat or 
you know, basically a totalitarian state that had control over culture and education and the media, uh, as well as uh, was centrally controlling a command and control economy. Um, Steiner thought that that was a very bad idea. Uh, and so he agreed with the workers partially, uh, but he wanted to make sure that there was an adequate sense of the importance of differentiating the economy from politics or governance, and uh, both of those from culture. Uh, the cultural sphere or the spiritual sphere would be the sphere of education and the arts, media, um, and Steiner thought that all of that should be um, able to develop freely without the state trying to censor it or the state trying to micromanage education and force everyone to do the same standardized tests or whatever. The state should just be about protecting um, human rights, uh, the rights of individuals and associations of individuals to go about you know, doing their thing. Um, so the state is just about protecting rights. The state doesn't get to control the schools. It doesn't get to control culture. Um, and the state also doesn't get to control the economy. Now the economy, um, all that the state could say to the, the economic sphere is um, respect the rights of workers and uh, don't, you know, the state would also regulate, it would have environmental regulations in place, of course. Um, that would be very important. But so basically what Steiner was pointing out is um, over the course of human evolution, these three basic uh, spheres of society have developed more or less autonomously. And the modern period has in various ways tried to get one sphere to dominate over the others. Um, currently, this is, you know, the, the global um, capitalist uh, marketplace is so powerful that it dominates the states, the nation states, and it, it uh, dominates culture. Um, and so we need more balance here, uh, but we don't want, you know, the fascist re regimes of the 20th century really tried to make the cultural dominate uh, over the economic and, and the political spheres. And so you can see the different and you know, communism obviously wanted to make um, the economic, the uh, state dominate over the economy and and the cultural sphere. And so, all the political pathologies of the 20th century are the attempt to make one sphere the be all and end all. And what Steiner is suggesting is that we really need to differentiate these. Um, and so, you know, it's a very practical program for I think resolving a lot of our uh, issues nowadays um, potentially. So I've been studying it closely and um, trying to see where the inflection points are to implement it in our present society. Mm, brilliant. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. And um, going in a slightly different direction now, uh, I want to ask you a bit more. So I hinted at previously um, the likes of Terence Malick's mm. uh, movies, which I love, and Dostoevsky. And I want to ask you back to Whitehead then. Have you seen... Uh, Whitehead sort of or Whiteheadian ideas um, expressed in films or the arts and which ones in particular if you have and what do, would you most appreciate about those then? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, Terence Malick is one of my favorite filmmakers, so I'm glad you brought him up. Um, the Tree of Life uh, is one of my all time favorite films. Um, just because I, you know, I think it's intended to be a meditation on um, the book of Job and this sort of um, relationship between human beings and God as mediated by nature is one way to put it. Uh, and, um, you know, Yahweh in the book of Job, uh, you know, sort of asking this question that Malik starts that film with you know, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world and when I put the stars in heaven and, and uh, on and on. Um, and it, it puts the human being in our proper place uh, and reminds us that though Genesis says we, the human is given dominion over creation, uh, Job is a reminder that um, we're not at the center of it. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, and that um, our status as the um, image and likeness of the divine and sort of the stewards, if you want, of creation is, our, our status is not um, as the, to be the kings and queens of the world. Um, we're not gods, uh, but rather to be um, good community members. <laughs> Uh, and, and uh, you know, the film um, sets the human social and familial and individual um, the human existence uh, in these ways in the context of the evolution of the whole cosmos. And Malik doesn't do the work for us in this movie by showing us like, there's this 20 minute sequence of like, big bang to the dinosaurs basically and it's like just inserted there and it's and then there's this narrative of this you know this family and uh living in texas and in the 20th century america and like he doesn't do the work to connect these two but he he in juxtaposing them um just i think really for me elicits this a deep perception of the uh, of the answer to the problem of evil. <laughs> and I don't know if film is, he's such a philosophical filmmaker, right? And there's a way in which a film can convey an idea and you can't really articulate the idea in um, prose. It's, you know, the film shows it to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so what is the, what is his theodicy exactly? I, you know, we could talk about that for a while, but I don't think I could do a better job than just saying, watch the film. Yeah. Um, but, you know, other films, um, uh, Aronofsky's film, The Fountain uh, is a really uh, potent one for me. And, you know, there's this sort of theme of reincarnation and um, it, it strikes me that uh, there are many ways to understand reincarnation. Um, I do think there is a deep truth to it, though I don't think it necessarily implies, uh, you know, one ego or soul coming back um, through a sort of in a linear sequence through different lives. I think it's probably far more complicated and uh, interesting than that. Um, but Whitehead's scheme is in some ways um, saying that reincarnation he says the world lives by its incarnation uh the world lives by the incarnation of god into itself <laughs> uh and so every concrescence which is whitehead's term for the production of novel togetherness like a uh every concrescence every actual occasion of experience is um the whole world reincarnating itself uh with a slight difference with a with a bit of novelty and uniqueness thrown in and that the uniqueness of each novel occasion is you know um achieved by the universe taking a new perspective upon itself um always inheriting the perspectives that have been achieved in the past and so you know watching a film like the fountain which is foregrounding a very human mode of reincarnation um i think nonetheless in a Whiteheadian way can express, um, you know, the very process of reality as such, like operating at all scales. Um, but it, it, you know, Whitehead's understanding of the process of reality in this film, The Fountain um, by Aronofsky really, it puts this particular human life that we, we lead and that, um, can be made to seem like the whole of reality. It puts it into perspective, you know, on a much larger, more ancient uh, story. Mm. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing there, Matt. And um, I think next I want to ask you something to do with those three spheres that you mentioned, and if we may call it the dominance of um, physicalist forces over our lives say in academia the media and um how would you like to see us come together say as christians practitioners of sanatan dharma different ancient ways of life and traditional ways of life and um, come together to 
reassert uh, our traditional ways of life and live those out in the 21st century? Hmm. I think for me, I, you know, I would frame it not necessarily as an, that what we need to do is restore traditional ways of life. I think, you know, modernity has been um, both, uh, it has a dignity and it, and it has uh, disastrous elements to it. Um, and I think, you know, there are certain modern values that I, I find important um, that m many traditional societies did not. Uh, and I think what we need is more of a sense of balance, like modernity, modern societies tend to influence or tend to uh, emphasize the importance of the individual, right, over everything else. Traditional societies are um, tended to, 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 to say the family or um, the community is, is more important uh, than the individual. And you can, you can overdo it in either direction. Um, and so I think we need a sort of integration between the traditional and the modern. Um, I don't have a cute name for, for that, but um, it would be, I think recognizing the you know, significance of um, the sort of, if you're familiar with the Carl Jaspers term axial age, uh, the significance of these axial age traditions that give us a vertical orientation and a sense of connection to the transcendent um, but we also need a, a sense of um, the imminent and um, horizontal plane, uh, you know, so there is, you know, this, this vertical, this revelation of vertical transcendence that comes with the axial age religions. Um, and I think that sense of ethical um, and, and moral um, orientation is tremendously important you know, to avoid being sucked into any sort of mob mentality. Um, <clears throat> but also we need, as it were, a second axial uh, revolution, which would recognize the imminent plane, the, the, the value of the imminent or horizontal uh, domain, um, really in light of the, the ecological context within which um, we exist, which the world religions, you know, coming out of the axial period didn't quite have a, um, a grasp of the planetary situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and so in light of the ecological um, catastrophe that we find ourselves in, um, there's a, a real uh, need to, to recognize that um, the, the human a state is embedded within a, uh, a larger uh, community of life and that our spirituality needs to, um, needs to uh, expand uh, its sense of the ethical community beyond just human beings. Um, we have a lot of work to do just to include all human beings, uh, but I think the, the axial revolutions in, in the ways that um, you know, Judaism and, and Christianity and, and Buddhism um, and other traditions were able to universalize the sense of human community. You could be um, a Buddhist or a Christian and be of whatever race, it doesn't matter, um, right? And so there's this sense of universal humanity, which is the unfinished uh, revolution of the first axial age, right? But I think we need to expand that sense of um, universal moral standing beyond just human beings. Not to say that, you know, um, there's a, a moral flatland and that a human being is no more valuable than a particular tree in the forest or something. I'm not saying that, um, but rather just that there is, um, every creature has moral significance, right? And so um, our sense of ethical community needs to be dramatically expanded Right, and so it's like completing this revelation of the vertical dimension given to us by all the axial religions with um, a horizontal uh, dimension. Um, I think we need to be able to orient ourselves uh, in both dimensions uh, right now. And in, in terms of how to how to you know build community. Um, 
I think conversations like this are a great way to do it. I mean, I always say yes uh, uh, to um, podcasts and, and conversations with people because I think it's it brings different audiences together who will then start talking to each other and we begin to build coherence um, across what uh, I think it was Peter Lindbergh calls the mimetic tribes. Like we really need to cross fertilize and uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's how we're going to um, generate a, a, a truly planetary understanding. Uh, and, you know, there's always going to be diversity and, and, and disagreement, but um, I think disagreeing in public in respectful um, and biological ways is among the most important uh, ways we can contribute to the evolution of consciousness. Um, you know, so we don't just have to be reaching out uh, to those we agree with. We can also try to have conversations with those, you know, transhumanists or antinatalists or whoever uh materialists and see if we can arrive at any kind of consensus um no yeah, amen to all of that um thank you matt and i really appreciate the, that clarification there and i uh, i think from my perspective for um from the christian tradition i think you see this breakthrough in people like uh, dr michael martin who i mentioned the place of creatures and the creation is more is expanded and considered more important. Wendell Berry, people like that, and you see it across different traditions, of course. So, um, in line with that, I just wanted to ask you from the Christian perspective. Then, are there any Christians particularly today that you find insightful or that you would like to speak with? Um, well, I mean, I, I should mention um, the process theologian John Cobb Jr., uh, who I am grateful I do get to speak to. Um, uh, somewhat frequently. Um, David Ray Griffin's another process uh, theologian, a Christian, um, who I think is has done a tremendous amount uh, in his countless publications to you know bring Whitehead more into the theological conversation, but also to um, conversation among scientists and philosophers. Um, you know, there's there's a book that's been influential for my own spiritual development uh, by Valentin Tomberg called uh, Meditations on the Tarot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was a student of Steiner's for a time and then he uh, uh, became a Catholic later in his life and um, but has this, you know, deeply um, enriching uh, esoteric reading of, of Christianity that um, food, food for my soul. Um, I guess he's not exactly contemporary. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, that, that's that's who comes to mind at the moment. No, that's fair enough. That's great. Thank you, Matt. And uh, then, is there anything else that you're working on now at the moment, Matt, or that you still feel the passion to get involved with in the future? You'd like to tell us about? Um, well, I, you know, I'm I'm trying to imagine the future of education. You know, I'm I'm a professor and teacher, and um, I teach at this this small. Uh, private nonprofit university and uh, I teach mostly online now and I'm just looking at the role that the university has played historically um, and where it has come to now. Um, I think it's clear that the model of the modern university is, is not sustainable. Um, the, the, <laughs> the public um, understanding of the the role that the academy plays um, in 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 public life, I think, is changing. Uh, there's this severe critique of elitism and uh, of technocracy and the way that Ivy League schools are producing a certain kind of managerial technocratic consciousness that's doing great harm in the world, and so. Um, universities, while I, I would want to defend the values that they have stood for historically, are also, um, they've been corrupted in various ways. And so, you know, I'm really trying to think through uh, and try to start some initiatives um, that would help us lay the foundation for a, a, the future of education. Um, education is a sort of lifelong 
uh, pursuit uh, and ultimately a spiritual practice, um, something more like, you know, as, how the Greeks understood um, philosophy in the context of paideia or the German idealists would say bildung, um, this process of, of spiritual formation that we're never done engaging in, right? So education is not just for kids. Um, and I, I feel like it will always play a, um, a central role in, in keeping uh, a civilization vibrant. And um, it's not playing that role right now. It's been reduced to kind of um, job preparation or skills training or whatever. And, you know, that's that doesn't cut it for me. Mm. So Thanks for that, Matt. And um, just lastly, then, where can viewers or listeners find out more about you and your work? Uh, I think my blog is probably the best place to go. Uh, footnotes to Plato, and that's numeral two. Um, a lot of my output is there. You know, I have my YouTube channel, which is also footnotes to Plato, and um, and uh, I'm on Twitter way often, way more often than I should be as well. <laughs> Yeah, you can find all that stuff on my blog. Yeah, thanks very much. And I really appreciate your time uh, today, Matt, and God bless you. Yes, thank you. This was a really enriching conversation, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, um, to speak about and think through some things that uh, I haven't really had a chance to yet. So mm. um, much thanks is due to you for that. Oh, yeah.